Welcome, uh, week two of our masterclasses for all of you that are thinking about the world's top business schools and how they fit into your plans uh, in the coming months and years, and of course a lifetime of benefit that will follow. Uh, last week uh, I was joined by uh, Fortuna colleagues uh, with their respective Stanford GSB backgrounds, and we looked at uh, the essentials of the school and its application. Uh, we're crossing to the East Coast, and we're focusing today on the Harvard Business School. And it is lovely uh, to welcome my Fortuna colleagues, uh, Rebecca Fogg. Uh, Rebecca, uh, herself a Harvard MBA, MBA alumna, uh, who did some fascinating uh, research work with one of the perhaps uh, iconic uh, Harvard professors, Clay Christensen, um, and uh, now uh, about to become a very successful author. Uh, also uh, welcoming uh, Judith Hadara, one of the co-founders of Fortuna and the um, former admissions director at Wharton. So we're bringing in a lot of uh, M7 uh, perspectives. I am trying to ensure that we focus on the individuals and we have slides that come behind us. Uh, but uh, given my technical skills, many of uh, our followers <laughs> We'll know exactly what that means. Uh, so I'm going to try to use my background that take us through uh, the, the uh, framework of our discussion. My great fortune to work with Fortuna means working with Rebecca. It means working with Judith. In fact, it means working with more than 40 uh, former uh, associate deans, admissions directors, associate directors of the world's top schools, Harvard today. Uh, Stanford, Wharton, the rest of the M7, INSEAD, uh, London Business School. We pride ourselves on bringing all of that insider expertise to our discussions with you. Uh, for well over 10 years, we've been offering a free consultation. Somebody calculated, Judith, I think you calculated, I've spoken to about 10,000 people in that day. Yeah, we did the math at wow. one point and we figured <laughs> out 10 years, 10 and a half years at this point, times the number that Matt does a week, times and times and times. So yeah. He's uh, it was, he's it was a, it was a question of the of, of the webinar. Exactly. Um, it, we put a lot of detail sharing your resume, your LinkedIn profile, so that we can really look through so many dimensions of, of you, your experience, your story, paths you've taken, choices that you've made, your accomplishments, and have the sort of uh, in-depth discussion uh, that, that we've promised. Um, now, these masterclasses are just one of the many, many resources uh, with uh, Fortuna. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Stanford session that we had last week that is on our YouTube channel. Uh, and next week, uh, we'll be bringing in other colleagues to talk about uh, the Wharton School. Uh, so put that into your diaries for next Thursday, uh, noon East Coast, I think. Um, the times change in Europe. So it's going to be a little bit later, it'll be an hour later, I guess. Um, but we're going to uh, get started and um, jump straight in as we think about uh, Harvard uh, Business School. And, and very much this personal uh, narrative. Uh, Rebecca, perhaps we can start with you. Uh, you know this application so well uh, and about choices that you're making, the career that you're developing. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. what do you see as the key issues? So Harvard understands that it, with its graduating classes, it has a bit of an outsized influence on powerful institutions, on society. And that doesn't mean every single one of us go on to have those kinds of roles. But Harvard understands that that's where its graduating classes go, and Harvard wants to have positive change. So it is looking for, knowing its students are going to have influence, it is looking for a class whose ambitions, whose integrity, whose self-knowledge and insight um, is going to be that package that enables them to have positive change. And it can be in myriad ways. It might be in traditional industries. It might be in social impact, um, a lot of different ways. But so I think the key distinction there is then, unlike maybe early stages in a career when you are trying to very much be what the people you work for want you to be, in your Harvard application, it's really important for you to be yourself. The other interesting thing is maybe at this stage of life, we haven't had a lot of chance to reflect on who we are and what motivates us and how it is that we do achieve what we do. And this is the moment to do that. And it will help you for the rest of your lives. But in terms of developing your career vision and your plan, it is having, you know, knowing what you want to tell Harvard is the goal, your career goal after you get out. And it needs to be feasible. 
So it has to be a thing or a thing that you can feasibly create. Um, it has to be something that you know the steps, you've really investigated it well enough that you have as clear an idea as you could at this stage in your life of how you need to get there and understanding how your MBA is going to bring you to that point. So there will be a lot of people who will be qualified in terms of scores and work experience and you know all around you know being terrific people but they are Harvard's looking to populate the class with the people who are going to have positive change and your career vision is going to be an important way of signaling that. We, we talk at Fortuna, Rebecca, about a, a gift. This opportunity mm. is you, the, the intensity, mm -hmm. perhaps, of your undergraduate and even graduate studies, but those early uh, years of your career, to be able to take a step back and to yeah. really think. Now, you, you've emphasised here you know, that, that it is this deep dive of uh, introspection. Mm -hmm. And about you, that the essay question Harvard asks says, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what more should we know about you? You really are focusing on those unique personal uh, aspects that are, are true for all of us. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, absolutely. And I think that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. And it ends up being where we spend the most time. Because, again, it's not a moment in time where maybe you've been asked that before. And so really understanding what motivates you, really understanding your strengths and your weaknesses. Very often, we are encouraged to look for our weaknesses. But that's not the whole picture. Everybody has weaknesses, or let's just say things that they're not as good at or natural at or care about as much. Um, so this is really that moment to understand what your strengths are and what you care about. And of course, that feeds into your career vision. Uh, I think another, another consideration that comes into this is how much should I share? And that is a very, very personal question. You should never share more than you want to share. But sometimes part of our personal journey is a, a, a difficult experience in the past, or it may be a neurological difference that we are coping with, or it may be, you know, so there are a lot of different things. And, you know, that is grist for the mill as well. They're not looking for superheroes and nobody is a superhero. So this is that moment to reflect on what matters to you, what kinds of environments are you happy in, when do you really sing, when do you feel like you're at your best, what are you doing, who are you with, when you feel like you're giving what you want to give, what you're good at giving, and then what we do as coaches is, you know, we, we can help elicit that. We will ask some really tough questions. Sometimes we get head scratching and this is very frustrating and this must be why I hired a coach. Um, but our job is to translate that into language that helps you understand and helps the business schools understand, given that's who I am, how can I transform that in, you know, how can I transform that into something that's useful for me, for my classmates, for my colleagues, for my future employees. Right. I'm going to uh, jump in and say, and I, I just remember reflecting on somebody that I talked to the other day, it's, it's, and it, there was a series of things that had happened in his personal life. And it was not about the story of those things, although that was incredibly important. What I said to him was, you don't have to go into the details of this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, but like, through this series of events, this is who I am now. This is who yes. I've become. And I, I really understand that sometimes students are wondering, how much do I tell? How much do I not tell? It's mm -hmm. really not about the story itself, about mm -hmm. the event, but much more so how has that then, because we've all been impacted by things that have happened in our lives, right? And so that's how we are who we are now and who like all, all of that comes to bear. So I'm nodding as I listen to you, Rebecca, because I find it really, really resonant. Yeah, right. that's a great point. The personal narrative is the insights that you come to as a result of thinking about all of these things. So it's not about TMI and oversharing. It's about the insights that you get as we together work through this. Um, and then it's also about what excites you. And, and, you know, nobody expects you to know literally seriously what you're going to be doing 10 years from now. I mean, we all get surprises, but know what you want or what you're hungry for next, you know, and to have really thought that through. So it's that linking of the personal, the personal insight, which is a lifelong journey, but start now, the personal insight. And then, you know, what are you hungry for? What kind of change would you like to see? What kind of organization would you like to work in or, or problem would you like to solve? And it's marrying those and creating 
that, um, you know, that vision and that level of insight that shows you're the kind of person who can pull this off. There are other schools, Rebecca, that explicitly ask, okay, so, you know, where do you see yourself post MBA? Mm. That's sometimes in 50 characters for schools in New York or a longer. <laughs> uh, um, not, not so far, but is, is that the confidence that, of course, you'll spend two extraordinary years with a very diverse, mm. open minded, ambitious, talented bunch of classmates? Mm. They know that doors uh, will open for you. So they're more interested in the characteristics than the future job title. I think that's I think that that's right. And and it may be with some of the other schools as well, to a degree, you know, you want you want to know that someone at this stage of their life has done done the hard work that they can to understand what they want. But, you know, most sensible people are going to recognize that having a wonderful educational experience is going to change that, too. And so. um you know, maybe the reason Harvard doesn't say, you know, spend a whole essay on what do you want to do. There's really only so much you can know at this point. You know, you have a full time job. You can't have spent the last six months interviewing people in, you know, the region of the world you want to work with, etc. But knowing yourself, that's the self that you are going to be carrying through into the world. So they want to know you've thought about it, but it is reflecting on who you are, what you care about, how you know that, that tells them what they need to know. Right. So staying on that theme of, of the essays and, and Judith picking up on a comment that Rebecca made about oversharing and until as recently as a year, two years ago, there was no word limit on the Harvard, right. uh, on the HBS essay. They have introduced it and colleagues have said, well, you know, in that uh, uh, case method, if they cold call on you, you have 60 seconds to say something <laughs> relevant, <laughs> insightful, <laughs> impactful. Uh, so don't go, you know, sharing five pages of your life story. Does this sort of, is this captured in terms of know yourself and really bringing it down to the essence? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, although it was very tempting to write on and on and on, we generally at Fortuna would, would tell people after about two and a half, three pages, like, okay, you're good. Not anything else needs to really be shared. Um, and, to, and, and that's hard, right? You've had 25, 26 years of living. There's a lot that goes into that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that knowing, again, as I was mentioning, not just the story of what happened or, or how you became who you are, but like, what have you done with that information? Mm -hmm. So that you really want to be thoughtful, I'm going to use the word curated in how you share your information and your background. And then again, these are going to take, these are going to all be like threads of a fabric and you're weaving that story together. So these are not, they may start out as very disparate pieces of information, but then as you look at it and you start to brainstorm and you have one of these crazy notebooks that I still, I don't know if you can see it, but I still write everything down in an old school notebook. And at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, wow, these things are a thread. These things are in common. And so I find that that process can be really helpful for students who don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll also tell you, it's great when you're working on the essays just to put it all down and then you'll begin to parse it out. So trust us in March of 2023, you're not going to know what it's going to look like in August. Um, and so this is this is a great place to start is just by by getting all of the things that you want to say in one place, and then you can begin to, to as I said, curate and edit that down. And, and Rebecca, from the two plus two applicant, might be a, a senior in college or uh, doing uh, the graduate study, studies, or six, seven years out uh, working in the Fortune 500, uh, working in a nonprofit, a private equity firm, um, this idea of really uh, thinking about uh, what is unique to you. So, so again, we're going beyond any uh, reductive limitation of what you've studied, uh, yeah. the job titles yeah. that you hold, uh, how are you then looking to translate that in the eyes of the admissions committee? Mm -hmm. That's where it is really important to have a sounding board because it is very difficult for us to know who we are in isolation. You know, we're, it's all relative depending on the kinds of situations that we face and all of that. And so in terms of what's new, unique about you, um, as Judith was saying, it is a curation process. There's, there's, you are infinitely unique, um, but not all of it is going to help Harvard make their decision. And so that's where it becomes this, this winnowing, process of, you know, we put it all out there, we develop these different things, you know, we look at the, you know, the different competencies and the insights that you've had. And then it, it is a kind of a ruthless decision making process about um, 
you know, what are the, the one or two core, you know, the seeds of mm -hmm. uniqueness that link to your vision, you know, they make sense. Um, you know, they're going to be strengths in that situation. Also that are going to be advantages in your competitive set. You have that set of competitive candidates. And so it doesn't mean that you're not unique and wonderful in other ways. Uh, it just means that we're going to curate that and figure that out. And then we're going to articulate it in, uh, you know, not in jargon. Um, it can be in experiences, you know, it might be in work experiences. Um, often it's in showing what you've done in, you know, difficult experiences at work, you know, the thing that didn't go as well, or the, um, you know, the time that you overcame a hardship or you made uh, a positive difference for someone. So the uniqueness, uh, it it's picking that angle that strengthens your story, that fills a gap in the narrative and explains why is it that you want to go from here to here and that HBS is the bridge that you want. Right. And I just want to jump in and say that uniqueness is not that you know how to play the violin backwards, right? It doesn't have to be a super, <laughs> right, yeah. it doesn't have yeah. to be like a superhero talent. Yeah. It's just, yeah. You are different than the person that you share a desk with because of your experiences, because of the ways that you relate to adversity, because of what you go home to at the end of the day. You know, so so it, I think sometimes, and this is, I know sometimes students will come to us and say, oh, I don't have, I haven't started a company and I'm not that different. And I, right. you know, I come from a very quote, average background, like, but there's good stuff there that the, what, what sets you apart is how these pieces come together. Not that you have this really super unusual talent, uh, like you're double jointed. A, a question for either <laughs> of you, how, really how important. do men have either abstract or externalize the rest of the applicant pool? Because if you're saying, well, you know, I am a McKinsey, Bain or BCG uh, associate, they're well represented. I am an analyst at one of the investment banks or a software engineer in big tech. There will be people with comparable professional experience it's again bringing the focus back to you perhaps you've mentioned uh, Rebecca this sense of impact which is digging digging a lot deeper to then share with the admissions committee um the opportunities that you've had and what you've done with them mm -hmm. yeah um and tying in a bunch of things that people are saying so I I slightly regret that I said competitive set because you're you're not you're not necessarily trying to prove that you are better than you know all of these other exceptional people uh, you know, Harvard, because they could fill an entire class with, you know, they could fill 10 classes with the people that apply. Maybe it's more, it's being, you know, what, what, uh, you know, your special sauce, not, it's not the superpower necessarily, but you know, what is, what is important and unique to you that is going to complement their class. So, um, to, to Judith's point, it's not like you've done something that nobody else in the world has entirely has done. Maybe you have, but it's figuring out that, um, you know, I call it a special sauce sort of thing, you know, um, but in terms of the, uh, you know, articulating that to Harvard and, and why that matters, um, you can create, uh, you know, you create that narrative that helps them understand how you're going to fit into that class and how you're going to be as a classmate um, and, and how you might end up translating what is special and, you know, powerful to you. How are you going to translate that into the world? Mm. I don't know if it's a brand statement, a mission statement, a, a, a tagline. Uh, Harvard Business School uh, educates leaders that have impact. Now, we've already brought yeah. impact to the discussion. Judith, Rebecca, we couldn't have a discussion about HBS without the word leadership <laughs> coming into yeah, any right. of these seven uh, discussion points. Um, what is it about that leadership journey that we're then trying to share? Mm. Um, so you, you're talking about, I think, you know, what does impact mean? Impact can mean a lot of different things. And that is part of what we can help do. And again, it is, it's partly a, a self-discovery process. It is partly a translation and curation process, but, you know, they're looking for a very, very broad range of impact. So, it's not necessarily just social impact, although that's really important. You know, there are people who are e extremely uh, interested in that startup that is going to help with social care problems or with healthcare problems. But I think that they are looking for 
somebody who's going to go into whatever their chosen field is, and they're not just going to accept things as they are, whether they're looking on an industry level, whether they're looking on an institutional level, whether they are looking on a team level, not everybody goes on to be a CEO. They want to know that these are people who are you know, for the rest of their lives, going to have the hunger, the commitment, the sense of um, generosity and courage to always be trying to change things for the better. So impact, you know, early in your career, impact could be something as simple as, uh, you know, I saw that HR wasn't giving me a diverse slate of candidates for my open position. I only managed seven people, um, but I wasn't happy with the CVs I got. And so I went to HR and we talked about it. And, and actually, we realized that there was this larger problem. You know, when you're later in your career and maybe you have a larger span of impact or control or you're starting your own business, you know, then maybe it's a different kind of impact. During COVID, the impact, you know, I, I knew people who were very active in seeing to the mental health of colleagues. And that might be official, it might be unofficial, but they're looking at impact on a lot of different levels. Um, it can be seeing an organization through really difficult times. And, you know, it's not always... You know, we read a lot about layoffs. Um, that's impact too. The impact that you have is not always going to be something that one would choose. So it's, do you have people of integrity in those positions so that when difficult things, when difficult decisions are made, that they're made with humanity, that they are made um, with, you know, rigorous forethought. Uh, you know, if you're going to have impact, it needs to be done as well as possible. So I think impact is a very broad word and it's up to the applicant to define it mm -hmm. and to define it in a way that is meaningful to them and that Harvard can understand and say, yeah, this is someone who complements the class. This is someone who's gonna challenge their classmates you know, in a positive way, maybe to think in a different way about impact. Right. And of course, there's the candidate's voice. There is equally uh, the recommender's voice. And as we look at each of the different parts uh, of the application puzzle, uh, Judith, uh, lots of smart applicants. They're all enjoying a fast track of professional development. Uh, recommenders really can then be an opportunity to, to, to share insights, perspectives of, you know, what makes them tick and, and the impact Rebecca was describing. So what are your recommendations for the choice of recommender and what we're trying to capture? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is that you don't necessarily want to choose the individual that has the biggest title. Um, certainly, although it's tempting, you really want to go for somebody that knows you, that knows your work, that has spent time with you, um, and that may be somebody from your not your current position, but maybe the first position you had out of undergrad that you've kept in touch with. Um, that was really there in the beginning when you were just getting your feet wet and you were learning how to work and you were learning how to lead and you were learning how to be part of a team and all that, that goes on when you're you know, just starting out in your career. Um, and then you may choose someone from a current position as well. And you can show that real balance um, and that you can really see that growth that goes on from that first position to where you are right now. I can tell you though, having experienced this, that the first question people will ask me when I'm, when I'm going through this with them is, well, I obviously I should go for the president or the vice president because like that's gonna be the most impressive. Mm -hmm. And in all likelihood, unless you report to that person directly, what they're getting is hearsay about how you are as a person on the team, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have that kind of direct interaction with you. They're not knowing what you're like at two o'clock in the morning when you've been up working on a project, or they don't know, they don't see you mentoring the summer intern, or they don't see you, you know, day in and day out working to get better at what you're doing or working to understand the model. So I really go for the closest draw circle around yourself and the people that are, that you interact with on a daily basis and go for the, somebody that really knows what you're up to. Um, and that also understands what it is you want to do with this degree, right? Your, um, your job as, as an applicant is to educate your recommenders. You never want to let them go write whatever they want, right? You really want to prepare them. You want them to understand, I'm applying to CBS, I'm applying to Harvard, I'm applying to Wharton. This is why. And by the way, here are some things that might be helpful for you should you decide you know, I'm not going to write this for you, but here are some bullet points that happened. This happened last year, or this was different when I started versus where I am now. So you really want to 
choose people that understand your growth and also are going to be able to answer essentially two questions. For most schools, with the exception of Wharton, why is it that you, or excuse me, who, how do they know you and how do you compare to others, um, you know, sort of in your group, in your team? And secondly, what is some constructive crit criticism you've received and how have you responded? So when you begin to look at your recommenders, those are going to be pivotal questions for you to have in your own mind. You want people that are going to be able to understand where you fit in the grand scheme of things. Um, not just that you were number one in your group, but like, what did you bring to that position? What did you bring to that interaction? Mm -hmm. And secondly, not just that you're a perfectionist, right? You really want to choose somebody when they're giving you constructive criticism and everybody's like, oh, I don't know what to say. It's going to make me look bad. Nobody goes to business school without things they have to work on. Because if you were perfect, you wouldn't bother going to spend two years and get your MBA, right? So you really want to have something very specific that you've responded to. Maybe you were a little unsure of um, your, your particular deal that you were working on and you were a little soft-spoken or you didn't make your points clear enough. So maybe communication is something that you've developed over time. Or maybe you learned how to not be so hard on yourself. Um, or maybe you recognized that you needed to get outside interaction from ask more people around you for feedback before you present it um, to, to a C-suite, right? So all these things, and I'm, I'm smiling because I know that everybody on this call has had a situation where they got feedback mm -hmm. and it's always hard to get. More than one. <laughs> right? I got some last week and I'm like, oh gosh, really? <laughs> but now I thought about it. I'm like, oh, I guess I could have done that differently. Mm -hmm. So just to take a deep breath and then say, okay, I'm going to use this. This is going to be really helpful. Again, you're not, no, if you were, if you were absolutely perfect professionally, you probably would not be going to business school. So um, it is hard. And, and then I will stop rambling a little bit. It is definitely hard to manage up. It's hard to ask people to do you a favor and write a recommendation. The tighter you can hold on to that relationship, the better you're going to feel about it. So information, education, interaction, incredibly important in this process. Um, and that can even start with a conversation. Hi, I'm applying in the fall. Would you feel comfortable writing a letter of recommendation for me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you an executive summary. I know this is going to take time. I'm really appreciative, but here are some thoughts that I have. To me, right. that's a great way to, to really begin this process with your recommender. Perhaps the added layer on top of the, 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 the fancy job title that... Um, um, that you spoke of in the beginning is someone saying, ah, that's right. I think Francesca, our digital marketing director, didn't she go to Harvard in 2004? Now you've never worked directly right. with Francesca. Uh, you're hoping to catch <laughs> the coffee machine. Uh, Rebe Rebecca, mm. again, given that level of insight and, and, and the sort of feedback uh, that Judith was describing, it's not a Harvard grad at all costs. Absolutely not. It's exactly what Judith was saying. It is somebody who knows you well, who has seen you, you know, in the heat of the fire and can speak best to, you know, the person that you know you are. So it, it does tie to the insights as well. Uh, but a lot of people, you know, most people, I think, will have that person who's close to them, whether it's a mentor or, you know, that really committed um, employer, uh, you know, direct leader. It might not be your direct leader because a lot of people actually will not necessarily want their company to know that they're applying. So sometimes it can be the last company or it could be a former boss in another department. Um, but ideally it is that person, you know, who knows you well, who has seen you in a growth spurt, maybe is the way to put it. Um, and I'm going to say, actually, there is no perfect business person. So not before or after or during Harvard, but so thank you, know, maybe thank you for of, that. <laughs> you're welcome. I'm still trying to remember it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, think of somebody who's seen you through a growth spurt and seen you, seen you learn, you know, seen you fit into the clothes after that. Right. I'm going to try to weave in uh, some of the great questions that our viewers uh, uh, are bringing up uh, and the idea that, you know, Harvard doesn't look at anybody that has more than five years of professional experience. Now, every year, HBS, much like the other top schools, will publish a snapshot, a class profile, the incoming class. They'll talk about average age, average GMAT, average GPA, this many worked in consulting, this many studied uh, engineering, and how that can be very reductive. And people say, well, unless I have that GMAT score, I have exactly that number of years of experience. It's much, uh, much broader uh, than this. 
as we look at that from a professional trajectory, a path that you've taken, we're doing what? I mean, I always think about the HPS team as detectives looking through bullet points. What is it that they're trying to uncover, Rebecca, as they look through uh, the resume or the CV? And well, they're looking for, they're looking to build a class. They're, you know, they're looking to build a class. So they are looking for complementary skills, complementary um, candidates. And, you know, when they go through a CV, they want to see career progression. So, you know, they, they aren't looking for a particular industry. They're not looking for a particular title or level to have reached. It is one part of your overall story. So they're looking for the scaffolding that makes sense with everything else you're telling them. So if what you're telling them is that, you know, your, your personal insights are, um, you know, let's just say that you're someone who's had a lot of personal challenges and, and, you know, you have overcome those, all of those sorts of things, then, you know, the, the CV needs to reinforce that in a sense. So maybe you didn't reach as high a level as you think you should have, but maybe you had a lot of things going on at home. Maybe you had young children, et cetera. So what they want to see is progression within the opportunities and the constraints that you have experienced. And it's right. our job to help you make sure that that complete narrative package of your application shows that so that whatever opportunity you have encountered, you've you've done your best to make the most of it. So there's not an absolute level. There's not an absolute, um, you know, industry or title or any of those things. It just needs to show that you have done a lot with what you have encountered, that you are reaching for more, that you have learned. Um, and also that you are, you know, it's important in the CV also to show, even if you haven't led people, which can be quite unique at an early stage in your career, leadership is still present. You know, there's thought leadership, there is integrity leadership, there is, um, you know, I suppose a sense of self mastery in maybe taking feedback and really making a pivot. So, what we try to do in the CV is to show those proof points to the degree that they exist that reinforce the personal narrative that that we're telling. I feel very lucky to be sharing this webinar with both of you. It's really, <laughs> really uh, fascinating. One of our viewers um, is thinking perhaps of applying to HBS and other top schools three, four years from now, and already thinking about, you know, how they can best prepare. I applaud any applicant that has you know, mm -hmm. taken a head start. Uh, Judith, is should they nevertheless be mindful that paths that they take, things that they put themselves forward for, shouldn't always be within the mindset of, oh, how will this come across mm -hmm. to the Harvard, uh, the HBS admissions mm -hmm. committee? I mean, th there's a level of authenticity and just genuine passion and interest for the pursuits that they follow in the next two, three years without trying to second guess and calculate everything. Right. And I wanted to second what Matt said. Congratulations on thinking about it. It's, it's terrific <laughs> that you've given yourself that opportunity. So for those of you that went through the American college application process, this is not the kind of thing that you want to do because, quote, it's going to look good on your application, right? So you really want to start thinking about in four years time, if you want to go through this process, what are the things that are really resonant for you? So if you, and, and you may not have time, um, you know, I'm looking, there's, there's lots of different ways to have an impact as we talked about. So it may be professionally, you're able to get involved with certain things, you know, smaller groups um, in your organization or you're mentoring or you're raising your hand for a particular project that might be super uncomfortable for you, but you know, it's gonna allow you to grow. Um, this doesn't mean necessarily chasing the brass ring and oh, what's the next job and what's the next job. But it's within the confines, perhaps, if you're just starting out, of, of where you're located right now. What can you do to impact that organization on a personal level, mm -hmm. on a company-wide level? Um, it may look that you are involved in things outside of work as well. And that doesn't mean that you have to be doing social justice work or working in a soup kitchen or volunteering um, at, a, you know, at a hospital. It should be things that resonate for, with you, right? So you've been playing rugby for a couple of years and you put together a league in New York City on Saturdays, or you really enjoy teaching kids math and you do that twice a month. You know, there's no right answer for 
what this path should look like. Mm -hmm. But one thing is for sure is that you want to start to educate yourself about what is business school all about? Why do I even want to think about doing this? You know, it is four years, so you've got some time. And I think that to, for me, it's a question of how do I begin this process of maturing and becoming a more actualized person through this process, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not this end goal is, oh, I'm going to get admitted to Harvard, but it's, I'm going to have this personal transformation and I might go to Harvard. I might not, I might decide not to go to business school, but with four years, you've got this oper beautiful opportunity to really mm -hmm. take some time and, and figure out what are these things that are going to you know, make you happy and make, and allow you to grow. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I, that I wanted to say is that it's really, you know, the difference between like being a baker and being a cook, the bakers need to be super specific about how much leavening goes in and how much salt mm -hmm. and how much flour. And if you're a cook, you can kind of improvise. So I think that this is much more about becoming a really good cook and allowing your own ingredients to meld and marinate and become that, that wonderful next product. It's not about making the most perfect loaf of bread you've ever seen, because that's a little too exact. Um, you can tell where my mind is these days, but I, I really, <laughs> I wanted, I just wanted to say with four years, it, it's a, I'm really glad you're asking this question now because it, it's a great time to get started. Right. And all of our viewers that follow the Centre Court Festival will know how much I love a good culinary metaphor. So, Judith, uh, thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, nevertheless, we do. There are ingredients to include and, and you know, can translate into uh, the, the details that we're then sharing. Uh, we've just discussed looking forward over the next three, four years. Um, but as we then reach the point of applying, we're looking back to bring a level of coherence, you know, all of these different threads and, and bringing them uh, together. So um, perhaps, Rebecca, you can talk about um, th these details of, of the care, the details, and how each of those choices to share can really lift different aspects of your personal narrative. Mm -hmm. Well, you you have the you know kind of the three the three legs of the stool or the four legs of the table you know so you've got your career you have your academics you have your personal life let's say that that is you know that that's this encompassing thing maybe that's your interest in your hobbies and then potentially you have an area of of personal obligation or impact and that could be family that could be you know um, volunteering and things like that so you have these. Uh, these realms and you, in terms of your application, you are looking for balance, you're looking for, uh, you know, versatility and, uh, you know, a well-rounded picture. Uh, and you, you know, not everybody will have uh, achieved as much in each of those realms, and that's not what it's about, but you want to be able to do a clear-eyed evaluation, you know, so you've done your introspection of, you know, who am I, what matters to me at this moment in time, as much as I know, um, you know, where do I want to be, how do I like to spend my time, and and then you look at each of those realms and you say, you know, what are the proof points and the stories that I can tell that reinforce that picture? And sometimes it's, okay, we really want to make sure we show this in the CV. You know, maybe normally you would include these bullets, but actually these are really interesting and, and Harvard will care because they help reinforce this point. Another time it might be, mm, you know, that's actually, that would make a great essay, but I think that's not the essay for, for Harvard, you know, so it is looking at all of those realms and looking for, you know, the bits that shine in them and then curating and figuring out how do they add up to that narration. And then it is, um, you know, it is a lot of ingredients and that's another way where we can help because it can be very overwhelming and you think that absolutely everything matters and, and absolutely everything doesn't matter. And you're also not telling the whole story of who you have always been and who you'll ever be. You know, remember, this is a moment in time, as Judith said, this is a really exciting moment to just be, you know, maturing and becoming who you are. So in terms of the application and preparing for it, you know, as you get into that actual nuts and bolts, you can start thinking about you know, what are, what are it like, think of it as a heat map in a way. And you look at those different realms in your life. What are the bright spots? What are the orange spots? The ones I where you like. I love that. I have never heard that Rebecca. And that is fabulous. I'm now I'm envisioning you. it as you use that one. 
<laughs> that is um, something that came to me as I was trying to figure out about story ideas. And I was like, why do I keep coming back to this? Oh, it's the heat map, you know? Um, so it's not telling everything about you forever. It's what's the right nugget for this moment in each of those realms. And how do we bring that together? And that's where the sounding board comes. You're not going to know right off the bat. We're not going to know right off the bat. It's a lot of discussion and, and thinking. I think there's a heat map, Judith, in the right side of your brain, which is, of course, where we keep all of our soft skills, storytelling um, that, that that is now lodged uh, <laughs> and will be used in, in the future. Um, th that nagging voice that says, oh, you know, th there is this part of my story, uh, but I hope it doesn't come to light or you're worried that the admissions committee will find out as soon as that nagging voice is in your head that's perhaps the time to say, no, I need to come clean with that. that, that you could use that in what, the optional essay? Yeah, 100%. You know, the real estate in 900 words is, is fast. It's less than two pages um, for the most part. And so optional essay, great time to say, junior year of college was very complicated for me. I had a family member who was ill. My grades declined. You'll see that I rebounded and did beautifully. I had a work gap in between 2021 and 2022, company re you know, realigned, currently starting in this next position. Like you do not want to wonder, oh my gosh, are they going to find out? You know how when like you're little and you break something in the kitchen or in the living room and you're like, oh wow, how can I hide this so my parents don't find out? <laughs> do not spend your time trying to figure out how to hide it because the truth is it's not as bad as you think it is. Um, ultimate words of wisdom. So just doesn't have to be the whole nine yards of like every single detail that happened. Just say what happened, own it and move on. Do not do it in your main essay though, because it should not define your entire business school application experience. And I'd be very hard pressed to find anybody that doesn't have a vase that they broke when they were seven right? Or um, 25. Or 25 or yesterday in my case. So <laughs> um, really doesn't, you could be literally two sentences. And I will also add, if you have one of these instances and you want me to like help you figure it out, I'm really good at this. So yeah. you can send it my way and I'm happy to help you wordsmith it, but make yourself rest easy. Schools have seen, I have seen everything literally in, in the 30 something years that I've been doing this, I've seen really crazy um, experiences and and situations, it is never as bad as you think it is. So please, right. Judith, please I've said this it. often. I, I needed you as the sister for some of the breakages of, of my ch childhood. <laughs> um, it's interesting that in pulling together these three masterclasses, you know, last week, uh, Stanford, and it's uh, recorded and available on our YouTube channel. This will be very soon after today's live session. Uh, and then next week with Wharton, three schools, three very different approaches to the interview. You know, alumni with Stanford that could run for an hour and a half. Uh, the team-based discussion with Wharton, we'll be talking about that in more detail next Thursday. But talk us, Rebecca, through uh, the HBS interview, which you've described as rapid fire. Uh, the HBS interview is unique amongst almost all of the schools in the sense that um, there will be somebody who has read your entire application. And then there might even be a second person who's just read your CV. And so what that means is that they can cut to the chase and having read everything, they can ask deeper questions, they can ask more detailed questions, they might actually even be a subject matter expert in the world that you come from. And what's cool about both of these things is it means that you can get to the heart of what really matters. Uh, it doesn't mean you can use, jar use jargon just because they might understand it. <laughs> no jargon ever. Um, but it's going to be a really quick, you know, lots of questions. I mean, they might even do 10, 12 questions in 30 minutes, which is not a lot of time. Um, so the way to prepare for that is to really, really know your story. And by story, I don't mean the imposter veneer you're putting on because the story we've that we're telling is the one that resonates with you. It is, it is the you that makes a difference to HBS as opposed to the you with your mates and the you with whatever. And so the interview is their chance, you know, to see that you are the person in that 
you know, in that application. And also just to see, you know, what's, what is your in real life impact like? It's just another sensory perception thing that we get. You know, they, they can glue it all together in their mind. Mm. The, the real you, Rebecca, clearly London is rubbing off on you. Now you have a group of mates. Oh, you're right. Case. You're right. When, and when it's you're raining in, outside. When you're back <laughs> in Boston. Um, and, and it really is 30 minutes. It's like, well, we'll be indulgent. You know, they, they've got an interesting story to tell. Nope. Um, you, you need to get to the point, right? Yeah, you do need to get to the point. And so in terms of preparation, it's not about... Uh, which I used to like to do, you know, you create your little transcript and then you know all the things and, uh, that's not going to serve you because you're focusing on this meta story of what's supposed to be going on. You want to, you want to know your story. You want to know what matters to you. You want to know um, what you hope that they come away feeling and thinking about you. Um, but then you want to really be present you really need to be present and listen to what is the question that they asked. You're not going to be able to anticipate all of their questions. So you just, you know, you will know your business experience. That's not something that you have to prep for. Maybe you need to have explained your particular role a few times. You know, it's more like preparing generally for things that you know will be a question. But other than that, it is be present, be very present you know, be well rested. Um, if you if you don't answer a question well that you think um, you could have answered better, you do have this opportunity for, well, actually it's required. There's the after interview reflection that comes within 24 hours. And that is essentially, it's a thank you email that we think of as a um, sort of a, a post meeting recap memo. So, you know, that's your opportunity to explain, you know, to, to articulate why you enjoyed the discussion because these are really engaging. A lot of the people come out of it, you know, whether they end up getting into Harvard or not, a lot of candidates come out of this and saying, that was really great. You know, that person, they were, they were nice and they were warm, but they were sharp and we had a really interesting discussion. And so you come out of that. And then, you know, if there's something that you feel like you could have answered better, you can say that in, and we help you, you know, we can help you with that. If you, you know, think it through, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's rapid fire. Um, if you need to take a second to think about something, if they ask you a question, yeah, don't you know, don't blather out if you really don't know what you think. It's perfectly appropriate to say that's a great question. Can I take a second? And you know, you take a couple of beats. Um, everybody's nervous because it matters to them. They mm. expect you to be nervous. Um, you know, so even though it's rapid fire, it's not inhumane <laughs> and most people actually quite enjoy it. And you prepare for it, not by memorizing who you think you should be, just by being familiar with your narrative and how you want to feel and how you want them to feel coming out of it and being present in the moment. And One I would say I've... when I was at Wharton, um, I was always really jealous. I think we all were, all of us in the M7, because I did an interview with application. I just got the resume. Mm. And it was hard to have really good conversations. It was overly scripted. People sort of had these talking points that they wanted to share with me in certain, you know, venues. It was the same story over and over and over. And so Harvard to me does a beautiful job of really, it's like having a conversation with somebody that kind of knows you, you know, and it really allows you to go in just a little bit deeper. So whereas a blind interview, you're just explaining like, oh, this is my progression. This is what happened, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and that works in some instances, but I appreciate how Harvard really is able to get, get that level or two down. Matt, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I was just That's reflecting cool. on my own experience and how we always thought in the M7 that Harvard did a fabulous job at it. And I wonder if uh, the importance that they place on this will take on even greater importance in a world of chat GPT when this one-on-one -on -one individual time mm. really is the chance to uh, assess mm. the candidate. One personal comment that I make with uh, more than 10 years working with my wonderful colleagues at Fortuna, as I think about you, Rebecca, as I think about Taniel and Malvina and Carl, all of my colleagues with HBS backgrounds, you're all wonderfully positive, can-do attitudes, you're contagiously enthusiastic, but viewers in that Harvard interview, they've learned to have a poker face. So, you know, you may not have got through that question quite as you hoped. You will not be able to read the emotion on your interviewer's face and you move on as Rebecca suggested. Now we're going to move on to one uh, final slide that we've prepared, uh, bringing everything together. Um, and it's in terms of making connection. 
uh, researching, uh, saying, oh, the case method, it sounds such a great way to learn. Well, Harvard knows that they've been doing it for 102 <laughs> years, and they must hear it many thousands of times in every admissions cycle. Uh, Rebecca, what's your guidance to really, you know, better understand the personality uh, of the institution and why it might be a great fit for you as an individual? Well, what you said is key, because the point isn't to know Harvard so that you know how to game it. A, you can't game it. But B, the point is to know that it's the right place for you. And there are, you know, there are other places to go and everybody is going to thrive in a different kind of environment. So I think the first step is just getting to know what is it like to be there, you know, getting beyond the headlines, getting beyond, you know, the Wall Street Journal articles and getting beyond the titles and understanding like, what is it really like to be there? If you have the opportunity to go, you know, if you know somebody who's been there or actually who is there and you can go visit a class, do that. They also do online things where, you know, you're able to talk to students. Um, you know, there's plenty that you can read their interviews, but it is it is important because it is a very unique way of being, you know, every school has their, you know, their team projects, every school has some level of participation, but they all have a different flavor and um it's just, you know, you're not going to be able to completely read about that. So you really do want to talk about, you know, talk to people. Some some aspects of the culture, I think, stand the taste, the test of time. So, you know, there, there are things that I will be able to tell you, I'm sure that you would experience if you were there today. There are other things that change. I've been thrilled to see how much more diverse the classes have gotten in terms of, you know, the, the, the people who are, you know, becoming part of the Harvard community, but also much more diverse in terms of people's aspirations and where they're hoping to have impact. That's something that you really do have to be connected to the school today to understand. And it's not even going to be an intellectual process as you have those conversations or as you read those interviews or visit that campus, it'll be visceral, you know, like you get excited, you might visit another school and you're just kind of like that's cool that's great for them. It's not for me. So make sure you give yourself those interaction points so that you can, you know, you have something to chew over, you can think about it, and you know you can see whether whether you tingle or not when you think about it. Right. And, and the seas of sea of the classroom, sea of the community, uh, Judith, this sense of once they figured through GMAT and GRE scores, you know, a strong GPA, you've got the academic vitality and rigor. You'll, you'll handle discounted cash flow. So the conversations that you might have with individuals that themselves have perhaps played a leadership role in one of the clubs, you know, there's so much more beyond the classroom mm -hmm. that's part of this experience. Uh, is, is that something that you would recommend? A hundred percent. Look, I, I look at applications to business school as a narrowing of your people, right? So talk to people that have things. It, it's a little overwhelming if you think of 10,000 people applying in any given year, right? I'm making up a number, but let's assume. But if you can find people that have stuff in common with you and that are in organizations that you have some resonance with or have had experiences that you can relate to or you know, maybe you're interested in doing something next that you might want to do. Talk to those people. And I'm going like this because I really look at it like spokes of a wheel, right? You're in the middle and there are all these things that you are sending out and that you want to get feedback on. So to find out what are the possibilities like, hey, I've, I've been an educator and I really am interested in going in this direction. What do you mm. think? Um, talk to people that are five years out. Talk to people that are 10 years out. You will find, though, overwhelmingly that the club and organizations and student groups, they really want to talk to you. Um, some schools, again, are better at, at making that information public, but with a little, you can do a little sleuthing. And you want that kind of feedback because I'm going to give you an example. Someone that has you know, a very different background than your own may think that Harvard is a great fit for the way that they learn and what they want to do and how they see themselves operating in the world. But Harvard is not the right fit for everybody, just mm. if, even if they're admissible, right? So you really, and, and that's sometimes hard to imagine, what, I wouldn't go to Harvard? You might not, if it's not something that feels like, a, like that's going to help you get to where you want to mm -hmm. be as a person. So um, again, reaching out, faculty members, it's a little bit hit or miss with whether or not they'll respond to you, but follow people that you're interested in for sure. So there's all these different ways of, of really gaining this very 360 look at the school. Um, and 
don't think just because of its rankings or its prestige or its esteem that is the right place for you because you may decide mm -hmm. that you want to be somewhere smaller or you don't want to be in a city or you really are interested in something that only is done at three schools, mm -hmm. for example. So um, I just, I, I talk, and, and the reason I'm so uh, excited about this is I talk to people a lot now in February and March that are thinking about this process. And they say, what's, you know, this is overwhelming. Oh my gosh, how do I start? always start by narrowing down who it is you're going to talk to in the beginning to get a lay of the land, and then you can broaden it out. But I do find that those first couple of conversations will give you a ton of information that's going to be really useful. Right. To pick up on just a couple of the viewers' questions, and you know, we've covered so much ground in the last 45, 50 minutes. Um, full circle, uh, Rebecca, I'd introduced you and mentioned work that you had done, research work that you had done with mm -hmm a professor at Harvard Business School, Clay Christensen, you know the demands that are placed on such a world-renowned individual. Um, where might you look to get a sense of uh, areas of specialization? Is it reflected in the research of the schools, the centers that they might have, uh, particular partnerships with other organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Gina, I would start with, they have a newsletter about their research called Working Knowledge. And I would sign up for that. Um, it is astonishing. And that is probably my main source of information to understand how much broader the school's sites have been set on the kinds of impact that they can have in society and also how much more embracing of different um, research interests. So for instance, they do some phenomenal research on gender in business. It is the best stuff I see coming out of there on, you know, things like implicit bias, things like, um, you know, how I just search it, you'll see them all. So I think that's a great way because that tells you what all of the faculty are researching and it's going to be, you know, capital markets. It's also going to be developing markets. It's going to be healthcare. And then, you know, as uh, Judith was saying, see some of those researchers, they're probably on Twitter, they, you know, uh, or they're on LinkedIn and they're going to be publishing, you know, posting about their stuff. Um, you know, so follow them down that rabbit hole and, and see what they're actually up to. So I think that's a great way because whatever they're researching is what they're going to be writing cases about which is where they're going to have industry contacts. And, you know, those are people who will be coming in and talking to you about the cases. Um, so that's a great way. The, the clubs that Judith was talking about as well, where is there, where there's very broad student interest, it's, you know, that also probably means that there is faculty interest because it's very much a chicken and the egg. You know, we, we come to the school because there's interest, you know, faculty interest in an area, they start a club. So I think that's a great place to start is, is working knowledge. Um, yeah. One thing for all of our viewers to know is that HBS always traditionally starts the dance of the admission cycle. So as we think about 2023 and 2024, typically the round one deadline in the end of the first week, beginning of the second week of September is the first and then other schools uh, follow. Uh, we wanted to um, whet your appetite for this exciting uh, and remarkable opportunity to step back and really think about what you want from life, your accomplishments, what that says about you, and how all of this comes together in the application. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning just how much material uh, Fortuna has put together with the sort of expertise that Rebecca and Judith have shared over the last uh, hour. Uh, so Manav, uh, in terms of the Harvard essay uh, and why Harvard or not, look through some of the videos, uh, some of the articles. Uh, Abhishek, if you're thinking about um, uh, applying in your 30s to business school, I think a piece that Judith and Caroline uh, wrote has been read by 285,000 individuals. We weren't all 25 and knew that we wanted to go to business school at that point. Uh, and Nicole, uh, your question in terms of international students and what you should be emphasizing, that's a great question for the free consultations that we provide to really look at your story, where business school fits in terms of those next steps. Perhaps that will be Harvard Business School. Maybe it's, it's another. But uh, I think I, I share everybody's view. Uh, this has been a fantastic session to get that glimpse into the culture of Harvard Business School and what they're looking for. So it just remains for me to thank both Rebecca and Judith for all of your time, Thank you. thoughtfulness and insight uh, Thank in the you. last half. Thank you, I had such a good time. I don't think Rebecca and I have actually done a panel before and this was like no. fabulous and I learned so much. So 
Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Well, I'm just excited for people who are at this moment in their lives. And um, I just really want you to get so much out of the process of introspection and know that you're going to have a great career, whatever happens next. And viewers, we will be back next Thursday for a session on Wharton. This will be soon uh, uploaded to the Fortuna uh, YouTube channel, uh, and you can catch the Stanford episode from the week before. But thanks very much to everybody for joining us.